In May 2017, my husband Jim and I owned a five-story, hundred-year-old building that housed our business. An antique mall on the main floor, our apartment upstairs, and various other tenants. Over the prior years, we'd experienced several back-to-back -back burglaries, prompting us to fortify the front doors of our business with steel bars and additional cameras. The police did capture these creeps about two weeks later, and they didn't get a fourth victim. They were both on probation for kidnapping, and rape served their time, and decided killing their victims left no witnesses. My dad is still my hero today, his quick actions prevented me from being the fourth victim. And the color, model, and make of car my dad described was the description of what they were driving when they were arrested. At 3 a.m. one fateful night, we were sound asleep upstairs when we received a call from Sun Troll, our security company. The motion detector had been triggered in an unusual location, not on the main floor where most of our valuable jewelry was kept, but downstairs. Typically, such alarms were caused by a spider on the camera or some other minor disturbance. We rushed to respond, unprepared for what awaited us. I was only dressed in a tank top and underwear, with flip-flops on my feet. Jim at least had put on pants. I went to check the intact front door, while Jim headed in the opposite direction to inspect the rear of the building. Suddenly, Jim called out. Someone's inside, I fumbled with my phone desperately trying to dial 911. In that terrifying moment, my instinctual panic overtook me, and my phone felt like a complex piece of technology. Eventually, I managed to call for help while describing the situation to the 911 operator. The noise of breaking glass and shattering windows echoed through the building. It was like everything inside was being ruthlessly destroyed. Listening to someone vandalize your livelihood is an indescribable feeling. Questions race through my mind. Who was in there? How many of them? What havoc were they causing? All I could do was shout into the phone, pleading with the faceless voice for help that seemed agonizingly far away. Keep in mind, I had been abruptly awakened to a terrifying situation, barely clothed, and it was escalating rapidly. As it turned out, Jim had come face to face with the intruder, Troy, as he was attempting to exit through the broken window. Just before I arrived, they locked eyes, and Jim exclaimed, Oh crap, prompting Troy to retreat back into the depths of the building. Troy dropped his stolen merchandise-laden backpack, vaulted over a massive iron gate, smashed through the door of the restaurant tenant, and then exited through their main door. At this point, Troy had sustained numerous cuts from the shattered glass and was bleeding profusely. Jim chased him down and tackled him forcefully, pinning Troy to the ground. Adrenaline was coursing through our veins. I was still on the phone with the 911 operator, urgently begging them to hurry. I feared that I might witness my husband's death. I rushed towards the scuffle, driven by adrenaline, as you tend to do in such intense moments. They were in the middle of the street, dimly illuminated by the orange glow of streetlights, making it difficult to discern the details of the struggle. Fortunately, Troy was unarmed and ill-prepared for the madman who had tackled him in the darkness. Unbeknownst to us at the time, Troy had committed hundreds of burglaries without ever being caught. Jim had the upper hand and held him down, while Troy wisely feigned surrender. Suddenly, the roar of an engine and the screeching of tires filled the air. I started screaming in response to the approaching danger. It was Troy's getaway driver, his wife Kelsey, who leaned out of her window and threatened, Get the heck off him, or I'm going to harm you. That bitch he referred to was me. This threat was clearly captured on audio, but I have no recollection of it. Kelsey, unwilling to wait, attempted to run me over. I vaguely remember realizing that the situation was spiraling out of control, but desperately trying to read the license plate number aloud into the phone. My focus laser-like and idiotic. The plate was from out of state, and I struggled to make it out. That's all I can recall. My brain seemed to block out just how close she had come to turning me into a bloody mess, missing me by only about a foot as she sped by. I dodged her vehicle clutching my phone in sheer terror. A year later, 
In the prosecutor's office, we had to listen to the 911 recording while watching the video footage from a nearby business with high quality exterior cameras. Jim began to cry. He had no idea just how close he came to serious harm. At one point, the sound of the engine revving drowned out my frantic screaming. My voice was nearly gone, and I was chanting the license plate number like a desperate incantation, but it was barely audible due to the deafening noise. Jim eventually released Troy, who quickly jumped into the car, and they sped away. The police arrived about a minute later, but the culprits had already vanished. Afterward, Troy's blood was all over Jim from the door's shattered glass. Jim was deeply shaken by the experience. We suspected that Troy was likely using intravenous drugs, which later proved to be correct, and I had to inspect Jim for cuts, using a flashlight to ensure we didn't miss any injuries. He underwent testing for any potential health concerns. This incident was treated with the seriousness it deserved, given the substantial evidence, the violence involved, and the attempted murder. Several months later, both Troy and Kelsey were arrested. Troy's DNA was found on the bloody clothes Jim had been wearing and all over the stolen car they had used, which had been ditched. It turned out that the couple was wanted in five different counties for hundreds of commercial burglaries over several years, all to support their addiction to oxycodone. We were their only mistake. They hadn't known we lived on the premises. Kelsey, Troy's wife, decided to cooperate with the authorities. She reached a plea deal, much to my dissatisfaction since she had attempted to kill me. Nevertheless, she provided valuable information that incriminated Troy on numerous counts. Troy, on the other hand, refused a plea deal. He insisted on going to trial, a prospect I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. During the trial, I was interviewed by the defense team, who, unbeknownst to me, could lie during these one-on-one -on -one interviews. They refrained from dishonesty in front of the jury, but in private they sought to exploit any weaknesses. I had no legal representation. I was essentially on the prosecution's team. While I could theoretically understand the purpose, it was still deeply frustrating. They began by interviewing me. They played the 911 tape for me, the second time I had heard it. They insisted that because I had referred to the intruder as they, I was lying about the presence of another person besides Troy and Kelsey. I explained that I used they as a non-gendered pronoun since I had not yet seen the individual. Subsequently, they interviewed Jim. They falsely told him that I had admitted to lying and claiming there was another person inside the building. Jim, luckily, saw through their deception and vehemently denied it. Finally, a day before the trial was set to begin, Troy accepted a plea deal, much to our relief. I had been spiraling into the most pointless concerns. Whether I should change my hair color from purple, I had just spent $700 on it. What conservative shoes to wear, and how to hide my tattoos. I was grasping at trivial things because the trial was looming, and I had little control over it. Kelsey received probation, while Troy served time in prison from 2017 to 2020 before an early release due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As of now, Kelsey seems to be living a clean and normal life, remarried with children, and appears happy. I occasionally wish her some minor inconveniences, but I'm no saint. Story 2 This incident occurred 16 years ago but it has lingered in my memory because it left me both terrified and feeling foolish. I reside in Honduras, a country with its share of issues, primarily violence and poverty. Growing up, I had become accustomed to the normalization of troubling things, one of which was the practice of families marrying off their daughters to wealthy suitors. Sometimes, this involved pressuring daughters to entertain the advances of affluent individuals, while other times it felt like outright sexual trafficking, especially in families where one parent was absent. This practice was more common in small towns but not unheard of in larger areas. My family tried to shield my siblings and me from the darker aspects of life here. Our parents worked diligently to provide us with a good education, 
a relatively safe living environment, and raised us to be cautious and avoid places where we weren't supposed to be. My mother owned a cafe in a port town, and many of her customers were tourists and foreigners passing through on their way to their vacation villas or beach houses. Among them was an older American whom my parents had befriended through casual conversation on a few occasions. They even invited our family to his beach house for a cookout. He always appeared friendly, exuding a kind and gentle aura. He even bore a resemblance to Santa Claus. One day, while I was taking his order, he asked me to sit down with him. We discussed my school and post-graduation plans, and nothing initially raised any red flags in my mind. I assumed he was simply bored and looking for someone to chat with until my mom returned from her break. Then things took a disturbing turn. He began commenting on my family's recent financial difficulties, primarily related to debts and my dad's inability to work due to an accident. I nodded along, thinking that perhaps my parents had sought his help or a loan. However, he revealed that he was talking about me going with him to the United States, where I had a visa, and assisting him while living with him. He made inappropriate remarks about my appearance, suggesting that everyone would rather wait until I graduated, which was only a few months away, but that my family needed help immediately. He argued that it wouldn't be appropriate for him to step in if we weren't his family. So if we got married soon, he would take care of everyone. I was dumbfounded and could only manage to murmur something like, no, thank you, sir. He told me I didn't need to decide right away, but suggested we go on a weekend boat trip to see if we got along. He claimed that my parents were uncertain about the situation, but had chosen not to inform me because they wanted me to finish school and make my own choice. He then twisted the narrative saying that, as the eldest, I needed to look after my siblings, and since my parents had cared for me, I should now take care of them. At this point I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach because it seemed as though he had genuinely discussed taking me away with my parents, and they were considering it. I started negotiating with him. I asked if I could bring someone along on the weekend boat trip, and if I could finish high school in the United States, among other conditions all while holding back tears. He calmed me down and assured me that my parents had already said no, but he suggested that I think about it and wait for them to bring it up. He also made me promise not to tell them that he had informed me first, emphasizing that I needed to prove to him that he could trust me. As it turned out, he was completely insincere. He didn't bring up the idea to my parents until two days after he had talked to me. My mom immediately rejected the proposal and he insisted that she should inquire about my opinion. My mom refused, stating that I would finish school, go to college, and then decide the course of my life. This revelation occurred during dinner, two full days after my conversation with the old man, and I burst into tears, confessing everything to my parents. So, yes, I felt like the biggest fool in the world for believing, even momentarily, that my parents would simply hand me over like a sack of potatoes, but I was immensely relieved that they had my best interests at heart. So, wherever you are, creepy Santa, let's not meet again. Story 3 I confess that I'm addicted to this subreddit. I probably spend two or more hours a day reading the posts, so I decided to share my own story. This incident took place when I was around 12 years old. My family and I lived in a small apartment that, despite its size, felt cozy to me. We knew some of our neighbors and occasionally invited them to our home. They were wonderful people. At the time, I slept next to my brother's bed, and his presence made me feel safe, as if nothing could go wrong. The only unsettling thing about our apartment was that our bedroom was adjacent to our neighbor's bedroom, which was slightly higher than ours. To see their room, you could stand on a chair, while they could effortlessly view our entire bedroom. While it was creepy, I didn't think much about it because, as I mentioned earlier, I had the comfort of my brother sleeping in the same room with me. Oh, how innocent I was. The day everything began. I had just finished dinner and decided to go to bed early, with my brother not in the room at the time. 
Everything seemed fine until I woke up and saw something that still sends shivers down my spine. I witnessed a silhouette of a person right next to the window. While I couldn't see their face at all, I knew they were staring at me. I screamed as loudly as I could and ran desperately to the living room where my mom was watching TV. I explained what had happened, but she didn't seem bothered in the least. She simply replied with an oh, okay, and resumed watching TV as though nothing had occurred. A few days after that incident, I began feeling better about it, but I decided to keep the curtains closed, just in case. Until one night, I woke up in the middle of the night and inexplicably had the urge to open the curtains. As you might expect, she was there, staring at me once again. Just like the first time I couldn't see her face, only a dark figure. I don't know how many times she did this, but for the next several days, I would wake up two, three times every night. Even with the curtains always closed, I had a persistent feeling that she was there, watching me sleep. A few days later, I decided to confide in my parents, and that's when things took a creepy turn. They informed me that an elderly woman living right next to our apartment was ill and had her son taking care of her. They mentioned that when they left to take out the trash, she would follow behind them and smile, patiently waiting for them to turn around. I tried to explain how paranoid I felt, convinced that she was constantly watching me, but they brushed it off with something like, she's a sick old lady. Scaring people is probably the highlight of her week. Just ignore her and continue sleeping. While I don't dwell on it much these days, I remember being quite upset with my parents. Why weren't they helping me? I followed their advice, ignoring her every night while keeping the curtains closed. It took some time, but I eventually began to forget about the experience. Then, a few weeks later, things took a darker turn. From my mother's perspective, our family was always different from others. She worked all day while my dad was at home with us, taking us to school and picking us up. One day while waiting for my dad to pick me up from school, a friend approached me and offered to take me home in her dad's car. I completely forgot that my dad was coming to get me, so I accepted her offer and got in the car. When I arrived home, I knocked on the door, but apart from my two dogs barking, there was no response. I became anxious, so I kept knocking repeatedly until I heard a loud noise coming from the elderly woman's apartment next door. It was then that I realized I had made a grave mistake. As soon as I heard the sound, I raced to the elevator and pressed the buttons incessantly. Our elevator had a window at the center, and I was terrified that she might appear in it, but luckily she didn't. After exiting the building, I chose to lay down on the street, attempting to process what had just happened. My friend spotted me and invited me to her house. I watched cartoons while her dad called mine to explain why I hadn't arrived at school. When my dad arrived, I ran to him and embraced him crying. He reassured me, saying, It's okay now. My brother's school typically ended 30 minutes after mine, so we had to return to school to collect him. During the entire journey, I was dreading my father's reprimand, but to my surprise, he remained very calm. He suggested that he was thinking of buying a cell phone so that I could message him if anything happened. After that experience, I became even more frightened of the elderly woman. I continued to keep the curtains closed, and I got used to the situation. Eventually, we moved to a different house, and I never saw that woman again. Not that I would have been able to recognize her, as every time I saw her at the window, her face was entirely black. That concludes my story. Fortunately, I didn't have to see what she looked like. I realize that my story may not be as compelling as some others I've read, but I hope you enjoyed it. I apologize if some parts are unclear. English is not my first language. Story 4 This incident occurred when I was 17 years old, just on the verge of graduating high school. I was homeschooled and highly encouraged to pursue entrepreneurship. At the time, I was working on establishing a photography business that I could run after graduation. To build my portfolio, I decided to ask a few friends and acquaintances to model for me, including a girl I worked with and her husband. 
It seemed like a win-win situation. They would receive free photos, and I could use them as sample work on my website. We planned a day to meet, and I asked them to join me at a local park one evening. You should know that this park was quite far out in the countryside. It featured soccer fields, baseball fields, a golf course, and walking trails, covering a large expanse of land and offering relative seclusion. The only house in view of the park was the caretaker's home, directly across the street from the entrance. Unless there was an event or a weekend, the park was usually not very crowded. I felt fairly confident about meeting the couple there because I planned to arrive about 15 minutes early to set up, so I wouldn't be alone for long. The park had an entrance that led to a parking lot, offering access to all the sports fields, the playground, and the pond. At the front of the park, there was a large grassy area where I intended to set up for my photos. I bypassed the main entrance and pulled into a small dirt section at the front of the park, starting to unload my props. Being a cautious person, especially as a young woman, I took a quick look around to check if anyone else was at the park. I noticed one car in the parking lot and two guys playing catch on the baseball field with their pit bull. Across the street I could see the caretaker in her yard, which made me feel more at ease. I decided to keep an eye out while setting up. I would glance up every now and then to ensure the two men were still on the baseball field. I had no particular reason to believe they would bother me, but something in my gut told me to stay vigilant. The couple I was expecting seemed to be running late and I completed my setup while occasionally checking on the two guys. To my horror, I realized they had disappeared. Their car remained, but the men and their dog were nowhere in sight. There was a slight hill in front of me that obscured part of the park entrance from view, so I considered the possibility that they had decided to take a walk on one of the nature trails. Yet, that nagging feeling in my gut persisted, hinting that something was wrong. I looked at the caretaker's house, and she had gone back inside. I couldn't pack up everything in my car quickly, so I grabbed my camera equipment, hopped into the car, locked the doors, started the engine, and got my phone ready. Just as I had settled into my car, I saw the two guys coming over the hill with their dog. My gut feeling quickly turned to panic. You have to understand that there was no logical reason for them to approach where I was. It was simply an open grassy yard, if the dog needed to relieve itself, there were plenty of places closer to them, such as the wood's edge, the nature trail, or the path to the pond. They walked around my setup, and when they reached my car, one guy went around the front, while the one holding the dog on the leash circled my car. I assumed they realized I had noticed they were approaching, and that I was no longer vulnerable, as they regrouped and walked further away, up and around through the soccer field. Once I felt that I was no longer in danger, I glanced down at my phone and saw that the couple I was supposed to meet had seemingly forgotten about our appointment and were at the beach. At that point, I was so frustrated that I jumped out of the car, gathered up all my props and shoved them into the car. This was my first experience of how frightening it can be for a young woman out alone. I've had multiple experiences since then, but this one stands out the most because I'm convinced those guys had ill intentions. And what chance would a 17-year-old girl stand against two grown men and a pit bull? One thing is for certain. I will never return to that park alone. Story 5 This story took place in 2020 when I was 18 years old. I lived in a relatively safe neighborhood, although my country had a high overall crime rate, so that's worth noting. Earlier in the year, my dad had passed away, and as I had no siblings, my mom and I lived alone in our house. The COVID lockdowns were still in place, but certain restrictions were being lifted, and people were gradually returning to work. Between my house and the train tracks lay an empty field. This area became a peaceful, quiet space where I could escape whenever I needed a break from the house. I would often visit once a day for a cigarette or two, sometimes for a little picnic. My home situation was complicated to say the least, and due to the pandemic I had nowhere else to go. On this particular day I went there for a few minutes to have a smoke as usual, 
I was about halfway through my cigarette when I noticed a young man walking along the train tracks on the other side of the field. He was barefoot and wore dirty, worn-out clothes. He noticed me and made a hand gesture, indicating that he wanted a smoke. I should have just left, but as a teenager I found it hard to say no to people. I crossed the field and handed him a cigarette. He took it, and immediately I felt uneasy about the way he was looking at me. He asked me, don't you live in that house over there while pointing to my house? I evaded the question, realizing that I needed to leave. I had left from my front gate that day, and for him to know where I lived, he must have observed me leaving from the back gate before. I told him I needed to go. He began insisting on giving me a hug to say thank you, and I declined several times. At this point I turned around and started walking away quickly, but I didn't get very far. He caught up to me, put his arm around my waist and panicked, not knowing what to do. All I could think of was that I needed to get away. I tried to start running, but he grabbed me from behind and started dragging me toward a row of houses where the view from the road was completely blocked. The fences were high too, so no one could see the field from their backyards. We were completely isolated. I struggled and kicked, desperate to escape his grasp. He eventually threw me to the ground with him on top of me, still holding me down. I couldn't kick him, and my arms were trapped. That's when I realized my only option was to scream for help. Suddenly, I was free. I could move. He had let go and jumped off me, running away. My heart was still pounding, and I was in shock from the terrifying encounter. He vanished into the industrial area on the other side of the train tracks. I immediately ran toward the road, and when I reached it, I realized it was empty. No cars were parked in my neighbor's driveways, and no one had heard my screams. If he had realized, that day could have had a far worse ending. He knew where I lived, and I was terrified of him returning. For months, I suffered from panic attacks and nightmares, and I could barely leave my house without breaking down. I moved away from there a year later, but I still get scared when I'm home alone or walking around town. Fortunately, I never saw him again, and I hope I never will. Story 6 This happened a couple of days ago, and I probably should have reported it immediately, but I'm not sure what to do now. A few days ago I was on a train heading home from work, a bit earlier than usual, because I planned to work from home for the rest of the day. After I got off the train, I decided to go to a vending machine to get myself a Pepsi. At the vending machine next to mine there was a man with black hair, brown skin, and tattoos of letters numbers on his knuckles. He was around 5 feet 8 inches, and he muttered something to me. I had my headphones partially on, and I'm partially deaf in one ear, so I took off the headphones and asked him what he needed. It took a while for me to understand what he wanted, but it seemed he was asking for change for the vending machine. He was looking for the change dispensary slot for money. I checked my wallet to see if I had any change, but I didn't. However, I tried paying for my Pepsi with my card, and he saw me do so. What he said next took me by surprise. Why don't you use your card so I won't have to stab you in the chest? At the time, I thought I misheard him because of my hearing impairment, and it was the first time I had been threatened. I asked him to repeat it, but he just said, Can you use your card without mentioning stabbing me in the chest? I felt uncomfortable but used my card to pay for the snack. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have. I scanned my card on the EFTPO's machine, and I think he ordered something like a snack. He then said, You don't usually do this. After he got the food, he looked at it, then back at me and said, Are you sure I said yes? He kept repeating the question, and each time I responded with, Yes, 100%. I'm sure you can keep it. He even tried to return the food to me. Then he told me about his friends using drugs like weed and crack cocaine, offering me some which I declined. He said something like, when you get to heaven, they will be asking you about this moment. He asked for my name, to which I gave a fake one. Afterward, he shook my hand and got on the nearest bus. Around that time, 
An old lady who had been nearby, listening to the entire thing, told me, You do realize he just said he was going to stab you in the chest. I was on standby just in case something happened. I responded that I gave him a fake name and left feeling startled. At first, I didn't think much of this encounter, but as the days passed, I've become more and more anxious and on guard. I tried reporting this to Crime Stoppers, but they called me and asked me to call the police. However, I didn't end up calling the police because I've always been scared of talking on the phone and causing a stir when it's not needed. I have Asperger's and a bit of an anxiety problem. So, here I am at the moment, not sure how to proceed. I should have gotten the old lady's details which would have given me a witness. I should have reported this the moment it happened, but I didn't. What should I do now? Story 7 I've never forgotten that event, even though it happened over 10 years ago now. Today I'm 26, Elfo, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it, and it's even creepier with my adult perspective. To be precise, this event unfolded over a period of more than six months. It all began when I was about 14. I attended a private secondary school in the south of France, and I used to go to my grandmother's house every evening to wait for my mother to pick me up after work. My grandmother, who was retired, would wait for me in her car when I got out of school. However, I wanted to be more independent, so I asked her if I could take the bus home, and she agreed. I enjoyed putting on my headphones and listening to my favorite music during the long bus ride lost in my own world. The nearest bus stop to my grandmother's house was about 10 minutes away on foot, because, by bad coincidence, the one directly across from her street had been condemned due to a lack of use. But that didn't bother me, as I've always been a natural walker. So I started taking the same bus nearly every day, at roughly the same time. At 14, I was still very childlike in appearance and personality. I had a youthful face, carried cute stuffed animals on my bag, and hadn't developed a woman's shape. I was naive, and this encounter would change my perspective forever. One day, I noticed a man on the bus. He must have been in his 40s, not very tall, and bald. He caught my attention because he was staring at me. I felt like he wasn't blinking. He gave me strange smiles that didn't feel right, but I was too young to fully comprehend the situation. Although I was still naive, I knew something was off. I didn't say anything. Instead, I tried to avoid the situation by looking in another direction. This was just the beginning of an experience I'd remember forever. This man started taking the same bus as me, every day, at the same time, even when my schedule varied. I had no idea how he had obtained this information. Did he watch me? Did he live near my school? He never approached me. He just continued to stare with unsettling smiles, never averting his gaze. I was terrified but didn't dare tell anyone because I was afraid they wouldn't believe me or that I would be prohibited from leaving the house. Then, one day, around May-June, towards the end of the school year, I couldn't take it anymore. I decided to get off the bus at a stop midway through the journey to try and lose him. I hid behind a tree, naively thinking I could escape his relentless stares. I had endured these persistent looks long enough. However, the man also got off the bus and started searching for me. There was no one around, and I suddenly realized I wasn't safe. The man began calling out to me, saying things like, Where are you, sweetheart? Let's have a chat. I was sweating and couldn't move from my hiding spot behind the tree. Of course, he eventually found me and started saying things like, You're really pretty. I'd love to have a chat and get to know you. I wanted to go home and felt threatened by his presence, but I didn't want to engage in conversation. I told him he was scaring me and to leave me alone. He kept insisting that we should get to know each other. A new bus arrived, and I seized the opportunity to escape. However, he also boarded the same bus and sat down, not saying a word but continuing to stare at me with a strange smile. My heart raced as I tried to figure out what to do. I made the worst decision of all, getting off at my usual stop and heading to my grandmother's house as usual. 
I hoped he would stay on the bus, but to my horror, he got off at the same stop and continued to follow me. The stop was in a lightly trafficked area, and there were small dirt paths that served as shortcuts to parallel streets. I believed he might try to kidnap me, taking me down one of those small paths, and I would never be able to return home. But I didn't want him to see my fear, as it seemed to fuel his perverse pleasure. He kept asking to get to know each other while relentlessly following me. I decided to increase my pace, but he kept pace with me, not letting go. When I reached my grandmother's dead-end street, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. I ran towards her house, where she stood in the doorway reading a book. She saw me approaching, red-faced and trembling in panic, and she noticed the man staring at us from behind the gate. Without the need for words, she understood the gravity of the situation. She threatened to call the police if he didn't leave immediately. The man turned and walked away from the dead-end street. After that, my grandmother refused to let me take the bus again. She picked me up in front of the school gate every day until my senior year. I never saw that man again. When I think about it, the idea of this adult man following a 14-year-old girl home, fixating on me and repeating this pattern daily is deeply unsettling. Who knows how far it could have gone. Today, I am still hesitant to take public transport unless I'm accompanied because the experience continues to terrify me. To that man, let's not meet again, and I hope he never crosses paths with a young girl ever again. Story 8 This story comes from Belgium and took place in 2020, during COVID confinements. I was 20 at the time. Due to the severity of the pandemic in Belgium, the law stated that you could only go out to exercise or go to work, so I had the habit of meeting with a friend, Sully, to go for runs and practice various sports. Both of us were into urban exploration and knew a spot on the outskirts of Brussels, which was an old sports and wellness center where we'd hang out after our runs. To access this place, we had to go through a hole in a fence on a street, cross a small portion of woods, and eventually arrive at the old four-story building, which used to be a sports and wellness center. The whole center took up a whole street block. On that day, we had just finished a five kilometers run and were heading to our spot as usual. As we were approaching the building, we noticed two teenagers sitting on the roof's edge. I remember thinking that it bothered me since we had plans to go to the roof as well. We decided to go to the hall area to wait for a bit hoping the people on the roof would leave. In the hall area, you have a clear view into the kitchen, which you must pass through to access the roof. We could also see into another smaller hall and into the dining room. Sully was rolling a cigarette, and I was gathering chairs and an office table for us to sit. That's when I began to feel unwell, like I was being watched in a disturbing way. I turned my gaze towards the kitchen and for a brief moment saw a man's head sticking out of the doorframe, staring right at us. The man looked dirty and I couldn't determine his age, but what stood out was his exaggerated happy expression, as if he had found exactly what he was seeking. I froze, unable to react courageously to the situation. Slowly, I leaned towards Sully while maintaining eye contact with the man and told him calmly that we had to leave immediately. My usual joking demeanor was gone, and Sully, noticing the seriousness in my face, didn't say a word. He grabbed his backpack and stood up. We ran to the football pitch, and we noticed the two teenagers were still on the roof. We started shouting at them, asking if the man was with them or if they had seen him. They replied that they hadn't seen anyone and had come by themselves. They assured us they would leave later, we decided to depart since we had already informed the teenagers about what we saw, and it was getting late, which wasn't in line with the confinement rules. As we walked toward the woods, I looked back and could have sworn I saw a silhouette standing in front of the staircase leading to the roof. My mind didn't fully process it, and I left with my friend. I was so shocked because nothing like this had ever happened to me before. I chose not to talk about it with anyone, fearing they wouldn't believe me or might make fun of me. My friend Sully, who was there, 
didn't get a look at the man, but he was as scared as I was just by observing my reaction at the time. I don't know what happened to those teenagers, but I found local articles and reports from that time about teenagers being chased by a man in an abandoned building. The information wasn't detailed enough for me to be sure it was the same people in the same story. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to show your support. See you next time.